Well, I got a message this morning. A new year, a new man. Amen. A new year, a new man. Let's pray real quick. Father, I just pray, Lord God, that you would use me as a vessel, a mouthpiece where you would speak forth your word, Lord God, to your people. I pray that the word of God would go forth, Lord, and that it would effect change in our hearts. Lord, your word said that your word would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you set it forth to do. Lord, sometimes we, we don't really know what you're trying to do in our hearts and lives. We have our own mindsets and our own agenda many times, Lord, that's actually contrary to your will. Lord, so we pray that you would help us to see your will, Lord God, and not our own. We pray, oh Lord God, that you would do a work. On the inside of our hearts and lives. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I really didn't think about this. I wanted to kind of just start off. I don't even really want to put this up on the screen because I don't want you trying to read while I'm trying to talk to you about this because I'm not really going to read the story. I just want to kind of like tell you or remind you of the story and then we're going to get into some scripture. Amen. But it comes out of 2 Kings 5 1, but don't, don't put it up there because I don't want them trying to read and compete. But, but if you ever want to go back and you want to read the story, it's the story of Naaman the leper. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of, the, one of the people that the characters in this story is the little girl, the little Israelite girl. I don't know if you remember the story. I'm about to tell it to you. But there's a little Israelite girl that got caught up in a skirmish. And uh, she ended up being away from her home. And, you know, as we were singing that song, I was just thinking, and as the Lord prompted me to talk about, you know, we don't really know what this next year will hold for us. Right, right. Uh, but at the same time, no matter what we face in life, God is worthy to be exalted. Amen. Yes. And I see that in this little girl's yes. character. You know, uh, in the story. Amen. Yeah. And, and that's just something that just hit me while we were singing. But I want to remind you that the main character in this story uh, out of 2 Kings 5, 1, his name was Naaman. And Naaman was a leper. Now, with this in mind, you know, the Bible communicates many, many times in an allegorical type of way. And I used this example before, but the word leaven that's used in the Bible is another word for, the, for yeast, right? And, and leaven in the Bible is a type of sin. And, you know, just as yeast is put into a batch of dough and it begins to take over, that's really how sin is in the life of people. You start off with just a little bit, just a little pinch, but before you know it, it takes over and it really transforms the nature of that dough. Well, just as leaven is a type of sin in the life of people, then leprosy in the Old Testament, really even in the New Testament, is a type or it paints a picture of the sinner themselves. Naaman was a powerful and a rich man. He was the highest ranking general over the Syrian army, but Naaman was a leper. He had a plague that haunted him, and he could not get away from his plague. And just as sin haunts every sinner and constantly reminds them that, hey, I'm still here, so with Naaman, any view of reflection, any seepage of fluid from his broken skin, any pain from an open sore was a constant reminder that he was still in bondage and subject to misery from this unrelenting plague that would not let him go. The God of Israel is also the God of Christian, and he is the God of hope. And just as God is apt to do, he provided us suddenly in Naaman's life. Have you ever cried out to God and said, Lord, I need you to do something. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I need you to do it suddenly. God allowed us suddenly to take place in Naaman's life. And the way that he did it was really in a very unexpected way. And it was from that little girl that I was talking to you about earlier. A little girl that was caught in a skirmish. Because you see, the Bible tells us specifically that God gave power to Syria. God gave power to to Naaman as the general of Syria to give power over his own people Israel and in the midst of a battle this little girl was caught up we don't we're not really told exactly how old she was she could have been anywhere from 12 you know really even to 19 years old whenever I'll look into the context of it but she was a young maiden is what she was and what we find is is that Naaman chooses to use her as a servant and what he does is he gives her to his wife to help serve in the home where, where he lived. 
And, and the picture that we get is, is that I imagine her to be relatively young, but I don't really know that for sure. But I, that's what I imagine in my head. Maybe 13 years old, but just full of 12 or maybe even 11. I don't know. That's what I imagine. Because I imagine this little girl just full of the joy of the Lord, full of innocence, not carrying a big burden on her, not oppressed and moping around. Come on. I know that, that many times life has a way of weighing us down, burdening yeah. us, and, and causing us to feel like we're just, just moping around. Yeah. And she, if anybody had a right to mope, it was her. She was taken from her home. She was taken from her country. She was taken from her family. And she found herself in a foreign place. But what she did was is that she did not leave the God that she served back in her home country. Yeah. She brought him with her. Amen. And one day I see this picture of her and I don't know. I just imagine I don't want to go around skipping around like a little girl because that might look kind of funny. But I imagine her skipping around kind of like you can imagine a little girl picking flowers in a field with a little basket full of flowers and just full of the joy of the Lord. Amen. And she says, oh, I wish that my Lord talking about Naaman, my master could see the prophet of Israel because if he could see the prophet of Israel, he could be cured of his disease. He could be cured of his leprosy. And you know what I get from this girl, if, if yeast is a type of sin and leprosy is what, what, what is caused to the, to the sinner, I see this little girl as a Christian that's filled with the Holy Ghost, amen, and that is on fire for God and has to tell just one more person about yes. the goodness yes. of God. Don't you know that that's what God's will is for your life? Yeah. Amen. Some people will say, oh, well, I don't know, man. God's called me to go into medicine. God's called me to be an electrician. God, no, no, no. God's called you to be a witness. Amen. That's right. God has called you to be a light in the midst of a darkened world. Amen. And this little girl was light in the midst of a darkened world. You see, Naaman, even though he was powerful, the Bible says he was powerful. The Bible says he was wealthy. The Bible says that he was a man of great valor. He had won many victories for Syria against the surrounding nations. And he was highly regarded and highly regarded. Respected, but Naaman was a leper. He was plagued with this illness, with this disease, a constant reminder, and he needed freedom. And this little girl was the one that was able to tell him yes. where he could get his freedom from. Amen. Now, if you read the story, it's a little bit of correspondence between the king of Syria and the king of Israel. But when it all gets down to the to the bare bones minimum of, of the story, Naaman shows up in Israel. And he meets up with Elisha the prophet. And the Bible tells us that Naaman's expecting some big old ritual to take place. I don't know what the rituals of Syria look like, but Naaman's expecting some big hoorah, some big event, some big celebration of some sort that the prophet would wave his hand and maybe tell him to do something that seemed very honorable and distinguished. But what the prophet tells him is this, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Now, Naaman is, the word, the Bible says this, uses this word for Naaman, he becomes wroth. The word is angered. The word is hot, furious, displeased. With the word that the prophet told him, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Now, we know that the number seven is a number of completion. Yes, it's God's perfect will, but God's perfect number, but it's his perfect number because he, he brought creation to completion and he rested on the seventh day. That means that the work is finished. That's a type of the finished work of Christ. That's why the book of Hebrews teaches us that Jesus is the true Sabbath and that it's not a day of the week, but we find our true rest in Christ and the work that he completed yeah. for us. On the cross. So he tells him to go and to dip himself seven times in the Jordan, and he becomes wroth. He becomes displeased with this ridiculous word that this prophet spoke to him. And, and he says, Aren't the rivers for Par and Abana more great than the Jordan River? Aren't the rivers of Damascus, where I come from, much make more sense for me to go dip in them? The Jordan is dirty, the Jordan is polluted, but the rivers of my country. 
Nobody's asking you, Naaman. You're the one that's in a bind. You're the one that's infected with leprosy. And God has a way that he wants to set you free. And listen to me, church. Many times people believe still and all that the ways of God don't make any sense. But I'm here to tell you God has a way. And he's not going to transgress his ways. And he's asking us to line up according to his will. So he begins to walk away. He's upset. He's frustrated. And, you know, his servants come to him and they say, Master, had this man asked you to do some great thing, and the word great there in the, in the original language describes something of distinguished, mm-hmm. something that would be distinguished or honorable. In other words, something that men would look upon and say, wow, that is a great thing. You know, the, the, he wanted honor of men. He wanted something that seemed honorable. Don't you know that so many times in life we get caught up in what man says looks right? Amen. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I know I'm telling you the truth. We get caught up in what man says looks right. And we have not really gone to the word of God to try to unfold from God's word what he says looks right. Because yeah. God uses low things. God uses base things. Why would he allow his only begotten son to be born in a manger amongst animals? Why would he allow his only begotten son, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, who spoke all creation into existence to walk, I'm sorry, to ride into town on a donkey instead of a stallion? Just those two pictures ought to tell you that God doesn't see things the way man sees things. So he refused to do it, but whenever those servants came to him and said, Master, you, if they would have wanted you to do something distinguished, you would have done it. Why not try? <laughs> what do you have to lose than to right, try right. to do it yeah. the way of this God of Israel? The little girl said that you'd be healed of your leprosy. So he did. The Bible says that he did. He submitted to what the prophet said, and he went to the Jordan, and he dipped seven times. And the Bible says that on the seventh time when he rose up, he had new skin. Mm-hmm. He had the skin of a little child. Fresh, soft, smooth. No more sores. No more seeping. No more... Have you ever you ever seen that? Like I don't know. I think maybe even I had a little habit. I'm not trying to clown no young people. If they got young, I don't think they got any young people like that. But you never seen a kid who start sucking on his shirt. I think I used to do that one. And you know, you, you they, people walking around. And it's all wet right there. It's kind of like you know, it's kind of like a little nasty looking. You know, you, and, and, and and but you can't see it because you're the one that was sucking on it. It's on. Yeah, just like name it. He's walking around. He's got sores. People probably can see it, right? I would imagine if the sores were seeping interstitial fluid and they were leaking through to his clothes and you could see it, some of them clothing getting stuck in certain spots and areas. So he goes down there and he dips himself. You know, the Jordan is dirty. He thought that he didn't look cool, you know? The rivers of Israel aren't cool. I like things to look a certain way. I like it when something when it's something that everybody else seems to be into. I want to do what the crowd's doing. Don't shout me down when I'm, I'm telling you something that's true. That's just in people's hearts and minds. They walk up in a church where there's 10 people and they think, oh man, ain't nothing happening in here. Let me go to Joel Osteen's church. And I'm just trying to say that just because Joel Osteen's church got 25,000 people and it doesn't mean, and I'm not even here to pick on Joel. Do what you want with Joel. But I'm just trying to say that just because he got 25,000 people in his church does not mean that he's telling the truth of the gospel. It doesn't mean that it's God's way. That This doesn't look cool to me. I want things to look a certain way. That's the kind of church I want. That's the kind of message that I want. That's the kind of preacher that I want. Give me something great. Give me something distinguished and is honorable to men. Give me something honorable in the eyes of man or I just won't do it. I'm not going to do it your way, sir. Well, then we have a problem. (laughs) I said we got a problem, church. Because, see, if that is your mindset and you're making determinations based upon your senses, your eyes will deceive you. Your ears will deceive you. 
I'm here to tell you we have a problem because now you're running after man. You don't really understand what God really looks like because you have not looked to the word of God. Because see, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 and 21 tells us that man's ways are foolishness to God. The word of God in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 21 tells us that God has cho chosen to make the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of man to be foolishness. Now, the science of man doesn't think that he's foolish, but the word of God says that he's foolish. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 21. It says, for the preaching of the cross, the message of of the cross, the word of the cross, the testimony that speaks of the cross. You know, whenever you talk to people that don't really understand what you're trying to say, because many times Christians believe, oh, dude, really, you're going to preach on the cross? I'm out of here, man. I'm going to turn the mic off, drop mic, I'm gone, because guess what? I learned that in Sunday school when I was four years old. No, no, no. You didn't. Because, see, if you learned anything about the cross when you were four, more than likely in the church that you were in, what they taught you about was how the cross affected your salvation. Mm -hmm. But they didn't teach you how the cross... Now, and the reason why was, let me tell you why that happened. It wasn't always that way in the church. As a matter of fact, the word or the message of the cross was very prominent before the word of faith ministry came along. I know because I've studied some things about the history of the church. When the word of faith ministry came along and swept across the globe through various word of faith preachers, the object of people's faith was changed. It was changed off of the finished work of Christ, which gives access to the Holy Spirit and allows the Holy Spirit to do the work on the inside of the man. And the object of faith was changed to your confession. That you had to say the right thing all the time. Or the object of faith was changed to how much of the Bible you read every day. Or your object, I'm not telling you don't read the Bible every day because you need to learn about your Jesus. Or the object of your faith was, was pointed towards how much you were going to pray. Or how much you were going to go to church. Or how many ministries you were going to be involved in. No, the word of the cross, the message of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Now, there's a whole lot more to the finished work of Calvary. I mean, listen to me, church. God bankrupted heaven and gave us Jesus all for the point. He was born so that he would die. Right, right. And it's in his death and our faith in that and our association with that, that we also can die to our first birth in Adam. Adam is the problem, church. Our sinful nature is the problem. It's thwarted our mind. It's infected the way that we think. It's perverted us to make us think more like the world around us. But I'm here to tell you, that's not God's will. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Think about that. Just chew on that for a second. What is the power of God? What did you think the power of God was before you walked in the church this morning? Because I'm here to tell you what Paul said to the Corinthian church was the word of the cross is the power of God. Why? Because you might be like Naaman and plagued with a leprosy, but the word of the cross can set you free. Because through the word of the cross, it says that Jesus, and you don't have to turn there, but in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, it says that Jesus, through the cross, destroyed the power of fallen angels and demon spirits that try to plague your life. I'm here to tell you there's freedom in Christ. Amen. He says, for it is written, look at this. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. See, that's what I was talking about. I don't want to dip into Jordan. I don't want to do it your way, preacher. I want to do it in a distinguished and an honorable way. Mm. I want to have these nice little programs in my church. I want to have all, I want to paint this picture. You know, like to have little social things that everybody can get involved in and, and everybody can feel like they're all a part. Listen, I want people to feel involved. I want people to feel a part. I don't want people to feel separated. But if we think that the way that people are doing church today, if there's not the emphasis of the truth of the gospel, then we're missing the whole point. Right, right. Can't have a bunch of social gatherings and not have the word of the cross in the midst of our ministry. Street. He says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20. See, I'm trying to get help you to think a little bit more about like God and not like Naaman. 
Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Amen? The foolishness of preaching. The foolishness of proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, for me, I just say, you know what? Keep your lights and your fancy music from your fancy music group in your fancy church. You can keep your clean little sermon that wouldn't even offend a tree hugger and give me the gospel. Mm. Give it to me raw. Give it to me right off the page and tell me what God has to say. That's what I want to know. I don't know. And listen to me. As long as the Lord would use me to preach, I pray, God, please cause me to be hungry to find out what you have to say so that I can tell it to your people. Because the people of God are his people. They don't belong to the pastor. Yeah. They don't belong to the preacher. He's saying, go cleanse yourself, Naaman. Go dip in the Jordan. Go on, put your faith in Jesus Christ and let the blood of that hill called Calvary make you clean. Yes. And so Naaman yes. did. Amen. He went and he dipped himself seven times in the water, waters of the Jordan River. And again, <laughs> on the seventh time, he came out with the skin the new skin of a child. Almost just like the story of a new birth. Almost just like the New Testament story of a new life when one is born again. But not just born again. When one begins to understand that to be born again, one has to walk with God and every day submit to God's will and not our own. You know, that's the big part of our true walk Amen. with God. Amen. That we have to learn by grace to submit yeah. to God's will and not our own. What is it that's in your will that's contrary to God's will? I know my stuff. <laughs> yes, sir. What, but, but I'm not the only one in this room that has stuff. Right? right? Of course. We all have stuff. Right. Yeah. And stuff that's against the will of God. Yeah. That he's wanting to contend with us about, that he's wanting us to go dip in the river about, in in a sense that the one that he would we would allow him to apply the cross to that area of our life. You know, one of the beautiful things that the Lord showed me about the cross. You know, when I'm talking about when I say the cross, I'm talking about for sanctification. I'm talking about to where we start looking less like ourselves and more like Jesus. Amen. Man, this is a process. Yeah. There's a death side of the cross. And there's a resurrection side of the cross. Right? Whenever, whatever that thing is in your life. I mean, yeah, for Naaman, it was leprosy. But what does that leprosy signify in your life and in my life? Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is that plagues us and stands between us and the will of God. Sometimes it's. It can be. Sometimes it can be things like addictions that are obvious in our life. We know whenever we have those that it's not right, right? I mean, those are easy things. But sometimes it's mindsets. It's much deeper. Yeah. Much deeper things that are on the inside of us. Personality flaws. Many times because of things that have taken place in our past. The, our psyche, our human soul was, was molded in a certain way because of hurts and pain and conflict and various life experiences. But God wants to get in there and he wants to work with all of that. He wants to reveal it to us and he wants us to bring it to him and say, Okay, Lord, I need you to apply the death side of Calvary to that thing that's on the inside of my heart so that you can replace it with your resurrection life. Yes, yes. See, resurrection life is the descriptive of the fruit of the Spirit of God being produced in your life. Whenever, whenever the flesh dies and the result is resurrection life, that's going to be the fruit of the Spirit being produced in your life. You know, you can fake some things that look like the fruit of the Spirit, but I'm here to tell you, if the fruit of the Spirit is going to come out of you, it's going to be the fruit of the Spirit and not your own. Because you're not going to be able to muster up the love of God for somebody that you don't really love. Right. Hallelujah. But hey, man, the Holy Spirit can produce that yeah. in you. You know, it's just like the story of a new birth name and coming out of that water. When one begins to understand what it means to walk with God and to submit to God's will each and every day and not our own. You know, if that makes you wroth, hot, furious, displeased and angered like Naaman was, let me explain what you're feeling. I just want to share something with you right now. Surely this may not, this may not be for anybody in here this morning. Amen. But have you ever felt 
furious, displeased, or angered in the midst of a church service. I mean, if you can stop back and you can think, I know I can. I can remember many a time I sat in a church service and I can look backwards and I can blame it. Yeah, but you know that preacher wasn't really preaching the whole camp. You know what? No. I felt uncomfortable in the midst of that service. I felt like the song service was going a little bit too long. I felt like whenever the person was leading in prayer that I just wish they would have left out. the. It just went a little bit too long. I felt like the preacher preached a little bit too long. And before you know it, like I started to feel a little bit frustrated on the inside. But, you know, the song service, they were singing about Jesus. The preacher was trying the best he knew how to talk about Jesus. The people that was leading us in prayer were trying to pray that God would get us closer to Jesus. So what's the problem? <laughs> it wasn't them. It was me. Uh -oh. I'm here to tell you that whenever you feel that kind of thing going on, just do what you want with it. Don't get mad at me. I'm here to just share with you that you're under an attack right. from demonic spirits. That's what it is. I'm not telling you you're possessed. That's not what I'm saying. No, no, no. I'm saying that the enemy of your soul is trying every way that he can yes, to remove yes. you or to push you away That's from it. the truth of the gospel that would set you free. That's to make you make it harder to get you closer to Jesus so that like Naaman, you could dip in that river and be freed from your leprosy, yes. to be free yes. from your plague, hallelujah, so that you could be delivered from whatever it is that's keeping you closer to Jesus. Yeah. And that's really what I want to talk to you about this morning. A new year and a new man. And I want to go through some scriptures. You here with me? Amen. You were born an old man, but you can be born anew. I know that we're all at different levels. And for some of you, this is going to be very elementary. But you know what? Let's hold on with me and let's go ahead and go through some of this. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32. And I'm going to just kind of try to like read some of this instead of just preach it all. Let's just kind of look and see what the text says. It says, because we're talking about the old versus the new. Amen? This I say, therefore, testify in the Lord, that you henceforth, from this point moving forward, is what that word means. Walk not as other Gentiles walk. Now, he's not, you know, he's not talking about like the way you strut down the street. He's talking about the way you live your life. Amen. The way you order your life on a daily basis. Yeah. He's saying you ought to not live like the Gentiles live. Gentiles are people that don't know God. In the vanity of their mind. What does that mean? They're empty in their mind regarding the things of God. They have their understanding darkened because they're alienated from the life of God. Through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. That word in the Greek blindness is, it really means a callousness. Callouses have been built or covered their heart because they've gotten hard towards the things of God. Listen to me. If you're honest with yourself, if you're honest with me, if I'm honest with you, every last one of us in this room have become at some point in time in our walk with God hard towards the things of God. We let our heart get callous towards the things of God. He says, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. Listen, whenever you and I, whenever the people of God start to act this way, when their hearts become hard towards the word of God, towards the things of God, we're out of the will of God. And God's saying, you ought not from this day moving forward, walk like other Gentiles walk. You should not know you're not because you're not that anymore. You're not naming, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. He says, but you have, look at verse 20. You have not so learned Christ, if so be that you have heard him. Have you heard him? Have you heard of him? Yes. Have you heard of Jesus, amen? Yes. And have been taught by him. Have you become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, the word disciple means to be a learner. Have you learned of Jesus and his ways? He says that you, if you have heard him and you have, and you have learned of him as the truth is in him, that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the old man. See, you used to be a Gentile. In other words, you used to have a life outside of the life of God, but then you got born again. 
And when you got born again, the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of your heart. If the true, if you really did learn about the true Jesus and you really did get saved, then the true, the Spirit of God came to live on the inside of you. And then when, once that happens, you and I are supposed to learn how to put off that old man. It's almost like he'd be a garment. I didn't think to do this, but it'd almost be like the old man was on you and you was getting rid of him. You got to take him off and you got to put him to the side. See, that's one of the things that is very important that all of us understand in this room this morning. We have the responsibility to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. That's it. Don't come around here talking about, oh, I couldn't help it. That's just me. That's just the way I act. No, no, no. You can help it with the help of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You don't have to act the fool. You don't have to be ugly. You don't have to be bitter. You don't have to be addicted. You don't have to be, you don't have to be nothing. The Holy Spirit will help you to act right. The Holy Spirit will help you to take that old man and his old ways off so that you can act like a new man in Christ. Hallelujah. So that you can start producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter what anybody else does around you. That's right. right? That's right. They might be aggravating you. They might be poking you. They might be doing all kinds of stuff to you. But you can produce the, allow the, the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in your life. That old man was corrupt according to the deceitful lust. He wanted what he wanted. Right. And he wants it right now. Right. And instead of that, you can be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Do you know that it takes time to be renewed in the yes, spirit sir. of your mind? Yes, it's not like the way they used to teach it in this scripture. You know, or I mean, I'm not even picking on the old preacher, but he would the way that one of the old preachers used to quote it was, through the washing of the water of the word. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind through the washing of the water of the word. Well, that's two different scriptures. It's in the same book. And yes, there's a truth in that. That the word of God will renew your mind. But it's not just like as you're reading, you're doing a brainwash. It's actually you got to understand the words on the page that you're reading. You got to understand, the whole, come to a place where you understand the whole of scripture to where you can dissect the parts of scripture to where you begin to understand the character of God to where he, he does a work on the inside of our mind where we start to think more like the Lord than what we thought it like in our old Gentile ways than what we thought like Naaman and said, no, I don't want to dip in the rivers of the Jordan when far part and a Bana, rivers of Damascus are better than Jordan. No, that's that's the way, that's the old mindset. That's the worldly mindset that, that says that things have to look a certain way and sound a certain way and I don't like the way the word of God says. No, that's the, the old man. Yeah. We need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and it takes time. You know that teaching that I've done many times on Proverbs about the word knowledge. Knowledge comes out of this book right here. Man and woman of God. Yeah. I'm talking about the knowledge of God. Once you have knowledge of God, now you can begin to apply that knowledge in your daily life. Once you start applying the knowledge of God, that's the wisdom of God at work in your life. Once you apply the wisdom of God for quite some time, you become rather proficient at the wisdom of God. And now you can begin to operate in the understanding of God. To where you can actually begin to see things more the way God sees things instead of the way the world sees things. But you and I were raised, theoretically, for a while by the world. Now the new man in Christ has to allow God to raise us up through his word. He renews our mind, he changes our mindset, and he teaches us to think more like him. And he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man. Just the same way you took the old man off. You have to start putting on the new man. That means you and I, again, have to cooperate yeah. with the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Amen? Amen? Which after God is created in righteousness <laughs> and true holiness. Now, I don't usually get a whole lot into the practical aspects of the scripture, and we should never neglect it. A lot of times I think that I talk about more spiritual stuff and just believe that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to you the specific details of your own life. But if it's in here, sometimes it's good to read. Amen. And it says, right. so he's, he goes on to say, listen, you're not the old, you're the new. Therefore, wherefore, put away some things. Put away lying. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Why? You, well, I shouldn't lie to you. You shouldn't lie to me. 
We're, we're neighbors in Christ. Amen. We're not supposed to be telling each other untruths. Be ye angry and sin not. What that means is, is that if the only type of anger you should have is a righteous anger the way that Jesus did. You're not supposed to, you're not supposed to maliciously be angry at people. He says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. That means, you know what? You better be quick to forgive other people. You don't want to harbor anger towards people. Listen, a root of bitterness will get in on the inside of your heart and it will begin to twist and begin to pervert your mindset yeah. towards God's. It will drive a wedge between you and God. Yeah, yeah. He says, neither give place to the devil. I've talked about that before where we open the door up and let the enemy in. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needs. You know, it's God's will for you and I to work and also make provision in such a way that people that have needs can also be taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the opposite of self to give so that others can be given to. To give even when you may not get anything in return. No. <laughs> I know that, that's probably, you know, th this is one of one. That's three of one. We'll get to uh -huh. that. We'll get to that uh -huh. one. Another day. Amen. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Boy, I know that that needs to be. <clears throat> Let no locker room talk proceed out of your mouth. Amen. You know, sometimes we think just because we're men in the church. That whenever we're with a certain group of people, we can talk like, you know, we used to talk as men. I only got my hair cut one time in home and this, and this lady that was cutting my hair, I guess she thought that I wanted to talk the way, and she was trying to talk to me like a man would talk in a locker room. And I just kind of like stayed, I didn't try to be ugly. No. But I just tried to stay real, you know, I didn't laugh at anything. I didn't even smile, you know. And at the end, when it was all said, and then she said, you might be a preacher or something. I said, I am. <laughs> but that corrupt communication is just like vulgar language, a vulgar way of talking. It's not God's will. But that which is good to the use of edifying, what God wants us to do is speak good things that are going to build other people up. Yeah. Yeah, that's not right. tear people down. That's good. Amen? Amen. That it may minister grace unto the hearer and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. I mean, we all have we all can have a tendency to do that. We need to be reverent and be aware of the Holy yes. Spirit. Be aware of the presence. Understand that the Holy Spirit is not about, you know what I remember? I'm so grateful, you know, after the tragedy of my life that I've told y'all a lot about, I went in, where God spoke to me was in that barroom bathroom. I don't go, I don't talk about this a lot, but I can remember one time I was still going to Cornerstone and I actually preached my first message in the youth ministry over there. And while I, while I was preparing for the message, I felt like what the, what the Lord reminded me of was the fact that I drug him in that bathroom. Now, listen, this is the thing. It stunk really bad in that bathroom. I try not to go to bathrooms uh -huh. like that. I've been in many a bathroom like that before. But it, it, it smelled, it was like urine all over the place. And it was so profound in my mind that I had drugged the Holy Spirit in there. But, but, then, but the, well, you know what the Lord reminded me? But no, I went in there with you because I wanted to be with you. So I felt this overwhelming conviction that I had drugged the Holy Spirit in there. But at the same time, the Lord was reminding me, yeah, you might have went to, but I, but I willingly went in there with you because I wanted to pull you out of there. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that corrupt communication, Lord, take it out of our mouth, take it out of our heart. Yeah. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Do you ever, have you ever stopped and really considered the motives of your heart? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, man, sometimes. like That's one thing the message of the cross will do for you. I'm telling you. I, I was sharing, I think, with Robert or somebody the other day. And I can remember the first two Sunday school lessons that I taught at Franklin. And I don't think that he'd mind me saying it. But, but, but Brother Raymond Harris came up to me afterwards and he said, let me tell you something, dude. 
Those two messages you preached these last two Sundays were like an x-ray to my soul. And they revealed something that was on the inside of me that was unclean. I didn't, I didn't do that. That's, the, that's what the message of the cross would. You know what the message of the cross does? It gives you access to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way in your heart and in your mind. To the point where the pastor doesn't have to spell out every little specific detail. But instead the Holy Ghost, the pastor of your heart will begin to reveal to you that which is right, that which is wrong, so that you don't no longer have to walk like other Gentiles walk, so that you don't have to keep looking like Naaman, but that instead you can come out the rivers of the Jordan with new skin, new and clean, hallelujah, a new life. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Boy, there's a whole lot there to be said. <laughs> Have we forgotten that he forgave us? Have we forgotten what God has done? Lord, give me a tender heart that I would be able to forgive others. Amen. And not just hold on to stuff and not have malice in my heart and be frustrated and bitter towards yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be that way because it doesn't do me any good. I'm getting, then I'm all weighted down. Yeah. The old man is who you used to be. Amen. Did you know that? You can't, you can't escape it. I used to tell people that all the time when I used to go do prison ministry. I'd say, look, man, we might not have everything in common today, but we've all had something in common. And I said, what I'm talking about is you might, we might not all be born again in this little hatch hole right here, but we've all been born of Adam. We've all been born sinners, and we've all lived a corrupted life to some extent. And this is what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. It says, in time past, you walked according to the course of this world. Didn't you walk that way before? Come on, church, help me out. According to the prince of the power of the air. In other words, you and I, just like the world, we're heading in a wrong direction under the influence of the enemy. It's a spirit that now works in the children of disobedience, among whom we all had you could say lifestyle in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But Paul said, don't live like those Gentiles. That's the first thing I wanted to remind you of is the fact that, 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 you, that you and I, that you were born an old man, but you can be born anew. Amen. The second thing I wanted to say was that talk about was the way that God gives this new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a familiar scripture. He says, therefore, if any be in Christ, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Listen, that's the message of Calvary. You're in Christ. I know I could draw the stick, man, but you've all seen it so many times, I don't have to draw it. You're in Him. And because you're in Him, the old that you were, all things have passed away, have been touched by the death side of Calvary. God put to death that old man that was born in Adam, and all things have been made new. You've experienced the resurrection of of on the resurrection side of Calvary. What are you talking about? When you got saved, whether you realize it or not, the Holy Spirit came to live in you. The same Spirit that raised Him from the dead now will quicken or bring life to your mortal body. Whatever it is that plagued you, whatever it is that ails you, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit reveals to you isn't right, the Holy Spirit will make you a new creature in that area. Yes. How does he do that? How does he give new life? Galatians 2, 20, verse through 21. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. How does he do it? He kills the old and he gives life to the new. How does he kill the old and give life to the new? Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. If we were going to read it in the Greek, it would say, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in the sin? 
Because it's talking about the sinful nature. Shall we continue to allow the sinful nature that we were born with when we were born in Adam to rule and reign in our lives? Shall we continue to allow that so that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we, talking about you and I, believers, that are dead to the sinful nature, continue to live our lives that way? Or did you not know? That was me for a long time. I didn't know. Nobody had told me. Or did you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ? Now listen, most Pentecostal preachers, even some Baptist preachers would preach this as water baptism. Water baptism is an outward sign. There's no water in this Greek text right here. Water baptism is merely an outward sign of something that takes place spiritually on the inside of you. When you got saved and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, in the mind of God, you came into union with Jesus. You died with Him on the cross. You were buried with Him in the tomb. And just as He was resurrected to newness of life, you've been given new life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He says, know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Don't walk like other Gentiles. Don't look like Naaman when you don't have to. Amen. You've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Hallelujah. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth or from this moment moving forward, we should not have to serve the sinful nature. We can cooperate with the Holy Ghost, church. We don't have to live in bondage to sin. We just got to do it God's way. Amen. We just got to be willing to do it God's way and not demand that it be done our way. Many times we want it done our way and we refuse to do it God's way. because we, well, And you know, a lot of times, let me tell you, I'm not going to get into this right now, but I will say this. A lot of times it's because of the fact of false doctrine. We have allowed false doctrine to be part of, of what we've listened to. And whether, you know, I, I had this, it was actually an old professor, and I know I've shared this before, but when I went to Southwestern Assembly of God University and worked up my master's degree, one of the first courses that I took, it was on VHS. It was before they had everything on computer, and I can still remember watching that guy. And everybody else didn't like him because they were scared because he was, they said he graded hard. He, but I will tell you this, he was boring. He was, he was Pentecostal. But he was just cut and dry, monotone, very, but, but you know what? He said some really good stuff. And one of the things that he said that I'll never forget on that VHS tape was this. It doesn't matter whether someone preaches error on purpose or on accident. The result is the same. It results in bondage instead of freedom. It doesn't matter, preacher, whether or not you did it on accident. If we're not telling the true counsel of God, telling people how to access the grace or working of the Holy Spirit in their life, where he's allowing the, the death side of Calvary to take place to those intricacies that's on the inside of them, so that in turn, the, the, the life of the Holy Spirit can produce resurrection life on the inside of them, then they're not receiving it, and, they're, and we're not growing. That's why last Wednesday, whenever we were talking about out of the book of Hebrews, and we talked about the fact that, that the writer to the Hebrews said, you've been in the faith so long, you ought to be teaching somebody else. But instead, you're still like a babe and you're still, you still got to drink milk. And because people can be in the faith for so long, I, like, and I told y'all that Pastor Brad Bullock said this one time when he was preaching that. He said, you got to park the whiskers to stick the bottle in their mouth. Spiritually speaking, people can be in the faith for all this length of time. And Lord knows I've been guilty of it. I was a Christian for 12 years before I even knew that, you know, whatever. I pick on myself all the time that Miriam and Aaron were Moses' brother and sister. And if you don't know that, I'm not picking on you. I'm just trying to say I didn't even know that. After 12 years of being a Christian. But really what we're talking about here is spiritual maturity and understanding the deeper things of God. The meat of the word. Yeah. Amen. That teaches yeah. us really about what righteousness is. That's what the context that, that we talked about in Hebrews was. 
So we should not continue to serve sin. Naya, you want to come up here? Naya and Manny. We're going to close with these last couple of verses and then we're going to worship the Lord together. But I just want to ask you this question in closing. What is your part in this new man? Amen. What is your part in it? And I want you to know that your part is faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Don't you know that if it was... But, but hey, don't we do this though? We, we look at works many times as though it were just the works of the law. But the reality of it is, is that people think they're going to make themselves more righteous and more right and that they're going to please God through all the things that they do. And we try so hard to please God through what it is that we do. No, it's through faith, through faith in what God provided. Because you know what that does is it makes you ever conscious of the fact that you are altogether undone and hopeless and helpless without the help of the Father. He sent you what it was that you needed. Amen? Amen. Romans 4, 3. For what says the scripture, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. When you put your faith in Christ, you believed God at his word. And when you believed God, God the Father put righteousness in your account. And now that you're righteous in the eyes of God, you can have relationship with Him. Amen. And now that you have relationship with Him, He allows His Holy <laughs> Spirit to minister to you, Thank to change you, you. to teach you, amen, so that you can understand Him. Last thing, Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive Him? Through faith. So shall you walk in Him, rooted, built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. That's really what I have this morning. A new man, a new life, beginning a new year. No matter what we face this year, God is worthy to be exalted. Yeah. We're going to worship the Lord together this morning. We're going to ask God to do a work in our hearts. If you need prayer, I want you to know that the altars are always open. Amen.